Okay, hi everybody. Okay, here I am. I'm still expanding from my book. Uh, I'm promoting it uh, shamelessly and enjoying it. Uh, Wisdom is Bliss, Four Friendly Fun Facts That Can Change Your Life, which are namely the famous Four Noble Truths, Arya Satya, that means. And uh, <clears throat> But uh, I changed the name in English to Fun Facts, the four fun facts, uh, which I think is appropriate, more appropriate than noble, because in English, noble to us has a good meaning somewhat, but we also think of it as sort of some snooty thing, some noble, you know, like some person with a title, but who's kind of a brat or something, a little bit. and. Uh, it did have that meaning in India of a class, uh, upper class sort of meaning, and after that a racial meaning. Uh, but by Buddha's time, Buddha made it, Buddha took it and turned it into a cognitive meaning. Noble for Buddha, Arya, meant altruistic to the degree meaning someone who felt literal, the boundary point is someone who had a visceral experience of another person by empathy as if and therefore identified with that other person and sort of to some degree imaginatively more or less viscerally whatever that boundary is felt the feelings of another person and so having had a visceral experience like that they tended to be altruistic so that sort of person so that's friendly you see for friendly fun facts and the fun fact the facts are the four satyas, uh, like realities, uh, you know, and the conventional and ultimate realities, but four ways of looking at them. And, uh, and then uh, the fun is that leading to the third, which is the real reality, the ultimate reality, the actual reality, which is nirvana, which is fun. Nirvana is not just extinction, it's only extinction of suffering. It's not just becoming nothing. All right, so that's, that's why I call them like that. So that's what I'm doing. I'm continuing with that on page four. I have actually, <laughs> in several hours, I've reached page four. And um, subheading here is, what is, so what is Buddhism anyway? Okay. Today in the modern world, Buddhism, as represented by its best leaders, such as His Holiness the Dalai Lama, is not a religion seeking to convert you. It is not asking you to drop your birth religion or your humanistic secularism, if that's your religion, non-religious religion, let's call it. Rather, it offers you a time-tested method of developing your own intelligent understanding of reality. All right? Ridding yourself of living in denial on any level. For example, well, so this is really important uh, because you may know of Buddhist teachers who want you to be Buddhist. So in a sense, they are trying to convert you. And um, if you have benefited from Buddhism and it has helped you in your life, you tend to, like I did for years, you tend to want, think that someone else would be benefited. And uh, Strangely, since I've known Dalai Lama for 60 years, he spent 30 years trying to get me not to feel that way. Even though I did feel, and he felt it was perfectly all right that I did feel, Buddhism has really brought me a lot of good things, and I will identify myself on a form, Buddhist, you know, sometimes, unless, unless it's a form where I think someone thinks that is some sort of fanatical thing, then I might not put that. But... Um, Otherwise, I would, I do. Uh, but it took me a long time to understand his point that it's a matter of being realistic. You can have unrealistic Buddhists who will do bad things thinking they are justified in doing it because they are Buddhists. For example, the Burmese Buddhists who are, have been attacking the Muslim Rohingya in northwest Burma and kicked them out into Bangladesh, into a terrible refugee camp situations. The hundreds of thousands of them, really terrible behavior. Feeling justified to do it because they are Buddhists and other people are not. Or in Sri Lanka, the Sinhalese Buddhists 
chasing the Tamils and, and militarily being very, doing atrocities with them because they are Hindu, uh, the Tamils were, and mostly they were Christian Tamils too and so on, but they weren't Buddhists anyway. And the Sinhalese Buddhists thinking they can do that because they're Buddhists. So that's, uh, I wouldn't say I'm a Buddhist when people are thinking that's what Buddhism is, but I would otherwise. But on the other hand, I want to be realistic and that's what we want other people to be. And in doing that, the Dalai Lama has, if you will, converted me <laughs> to his view as of maybe the last 30 years or something. But actually helping him out were my academic teaching, because in academia you do restrain your any kind of partisanship or proselytization tendency, which I did for 50 years that I taught. I did not push people toward Buddhism. Although I definitely think people had to consider Buddhist philosophical analysis, Buddhist scientific psychology, that I do agree about with the Buddhists. But Buddhist religious belief, you know, non-rational, this sort of chosen dogmatic religious belief, no, no way, never, I never pushed that. And I still don't now. So anyway, he converted me that we should see realism and enlightenment as a possibility in any other religious or ideological tradition. And therefore, we should encourage people in those traditions to, to come to interpretations of their traditions within their traditions that are realistic. And that's why my editors almost made the title of this book, Buddhism is Realism, uh, as a sort of counter to uh, the idea of uh, ignorance as bliss, you know, but then that work, you know, and that you want to know reality, in other words, because knowing reality is where you are cheer up, because the real reality is bliss. Okay, so that's, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's the best leaders. Doesn't mean that many Buddhists aren't, wouldn't try to convert someone to become a member in their denomination, they do. And they're not necessarily bad in doing that. They're being conventional in doing that. I went, by the way, to India recently to a conference organized by um, the Buddhist Global Institute there, uh, which is an effort of the government, current government, um, because they said they wanted to go past isms. And they were thinking in that case in terms of Buddhism and Hinduism, because they're very involved in their Hinduism, that particular government, too involved in it, I think, too proselytizing and too anti-Muslim, I definitely think. And, uh, but I went because they were saying, go beyond isms. So Islamism, you don't say Islamism normally, or Muslimism, you just say Islamist or Islam or Muslim. But uh, it is an ism, and so, uh, although they were only thinking in terms of Buddhism, that particular, in general, most of those people, I was pushing them toward becoming more beyond ism and therefore more ecumenical in relation to Islam, because that is a problem otherwise. All right, so living in denial, ridding yourself of living in denial on any level, I wanted to say about that. Why we don't hate the bad petropaths the people with the dark money, the, the nations, which are petroleum nations, and the corporations, which are petroleum corporations, who in spite of having known for almost 50 years now that they were endangering life on Earth by polluting the atmosphere with carbon, by peddling their wares and not seeking alternative energy system because they're making money with that system. Uh, but we don't hate them because they are people who have a good side. They think they're making money and they're going to leave their money to their family or something, or they're going to make a foundation and give some money to somebody. So they have that sort of, they have that idea. They think it's just a great thing is to make money. And then they might be ethical on the golf course or ethical in some setting, other setting. They might have gone to classes it's in, in, uh, in schools and colleges where they learned ethics and so on. But then they deny that they're destroying indigenous people, wrecking the environment, and actually threatening their life on Earth itself by continuing to insist on burning fossil fuels and 
controlling governments, preventing them from changing the energy system to a non-carbon one, attacking even the nuclear industry, not to have competition of nuclear power generated, as well as, of course, other renewable, what are called renewables. And uh, because it, what we are after, what we don't like about them is their denialism. They think they can just do that because they think that the reality is nothingness and that their evil actions will not follow them into a future life. And that they just get away, well, if they can get away with it in this life and then die before the planet is destroyed, they will have had fun and they think that's rational. So they're just confused and they do have a good side. All human beings do. And all, all, all animals, but you know, the, the one who wants to eat you, the predator you have to, their good side is not gonna, is not gonna help you until after they've devoured you. So you have to be forceful in defending yourself against them, but you don't hate them for being the way they are. And you, and the real way of helping them, freeing them from that bad behavior and yourself from their bad action is to get them to understand that there's no denial, reality is total, and you have to be good in order to be happy. Which is what they, they, why they feel restless and they need yet another couple of billions and they feel irritable with their secretaries and a little paranoid about their bodyguards, whom they, they might rob them, uh, and that therefore actually they're getting, they're getting this ill-gotten gain by being destructive. It's not really achieving the aim they wish to achieve, which is to be happy. All right. Okay. So denialism on any level. For example, we usually live with the denial of death. You don't think about it. You're afraid it will depress you. So you have no motivation to look into it and you don't want to face it. You think to yourself, well, we'll all be zipped up in a body bag. That is to say our bodies. And then we'll be, and that, then we'll be reduced to ashes or something like that. Or we'll be buried in a tomb and then we'll get rise. If we're religious, we'll rise at the last judgment or whatever. But actually, they won't be their body and they won't be nothing. That's, they think they'll be nothing, which is the sad part. They deny that they have a spirit, an inextinguishable spirit, a spirit that can become a Buddha can become like a messiah, become a great being, bodhisattva. They don't want to face that. They're denying that about themselves. Therefore, that's why they're unhappy. You think to yourself, so something like that's the kind of thing you think. So we do allow mourning, like, oh, dear, Uncle Joe died, you know. But we nevertheless keep up the denial of death, especially our own, whenever upcoming but inevitable, whenever upcoming but inevitable death. So, for example, the three roots in, the, in, the, in many religious traditions, you, you, it's considered a good thing to meditate on your death and to realize that your way of being now is not permanent and death is waiting because once death is there, it renders the more frivolous aspects of your life somewhat meaningless. And it means you should use your life in a meaningful way. And therefore, you become more alive. You want quality time in your life. You know, it's like that wonderful lady, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who helped develop, to, helped develop the um, hospice movement in America, who spent, you know, thousands of times spending time with people who were dying, helping them go, through, go, go up to that borderline. I wish she wasn't necessarily, I think, a future life person. She was a licensed psychologist. And, and therefore scientists, and therefore had to subscribe to the dogma of materialism, I suppose. She did, however, say she never had a single case of someone who was passing away in her presence who regretted not having spent another day at the office. They wanted to have quality time with family, children, grandchildren, nature, whatever, you know, objects of beauty, places of beauty, being beautiful with people. That's what they wanted, quality time. So that's when you know about death, when you really said, oh, I am really going to die. This mechanism I'm inhabiting, this body, will not continue forever. But my soul will, or some sort of consciousness will, 
And that's what I should be investing my time in to be meaningful, because that's what I'm taking with me, not my bank account, not my body. If you live in denial of reality, you will invest your life energy in fruitless occupations. You will want to live in a multi-million dollar mansion, but all its rooms and views will mean nothing to you when you die. You still pursue it because of your denial of death. This is an impermanent reality, this life, our house, our possessions. It is a changeable entity. But if you open up to death, do meditate on it, quote, thinking, this body of mine, this identity of mind, as inhabiting my coarse body, I won't keep them. What I do now, maintain house, food, youth, beauty, pleasure, all will be fruitless in the long run. Which doesn't mean I won't I completely just let it all go to the dogs, so to speak, but it means it, the lowest priority about it. And the higher priority is the quality of my consciousness itself. That's the key thing. Of course, you should keep your, of course, I'm conceding that in the book, you should, should keep your health to be able to use your mind and body to a good effect. But your main effort should be, what am I? Where am I? What should I do here and now? Not just who even, but what, where, and what should I do here and now? You will focus on how to remain conscious when going beyond your death, on the quality of your continuation, when you, die, when you do not live in denial of death, but wake up to it, think about it, and meditate upon it, you will be preparing for a good continuation while becoming more conscious about your day-to-day -day living. You will therefore live more realistically. For example, I remember I had some dreams last night. I was dealing with some little bit complicated things in my dreams, I remember. I'm not clear exactly what and the full detail of it, because I wasn't fully lucid. I was actually a bit lucid, but not fully. So I don't have a clear continuity between my waking consciousness of yesterday and my dream consciousness during the night. And of course, I don't when I'm unconscious, and that was useful. It was a reboot for my brain and my mind. But I was conscious in the dream, and I do know some of it, but not enough of it. I should know more of it. And that immediately, and, and that's a continuum through a unconsciousness reboot, like what happens to you after death. And therefore, if I'm more aware of that continuity, I develop it, and if I realize the, meaning, the, the meaningful thing to do is learn to what is it that continues and rises in the dream? What level of my consciousness is that? And how can I identify that even when I'm awake and contribute to it? And what is it that I do while I'm awake that contributes to having a good, useful time of being conscious in a dream? Like how can I learn more in a dream and so forth about myself, about the world, about others? Cultivate an intuition that moves on in the dream. If I, that's a meaningful way to be, be, be alive. Even though I have all the work, I do things, I don't think about that all day, I have to accomplish whatever things I do, but I would really want to bring that into my focus. That becomes then a more strong priority. If that's a, that's a great example. If you are a Westerner, then I'm being more realistic, realistic because I'm following, I'm not denying things that happen to you in my dream, which in a way you do, and you forget about them. You, in, a, in a way you deny that they happened. But actually, nothing that happened in your consciousness does not leave an imprint in your being. It doesn't change the fiber, the subtle fiber of your being. And therefore, if you are able to, just like in, the, in, uh, in your waking time, if you find yourself going down a path of thinking that is kind of negative and making you feel kind of uptight and bad and also not helpful, maybe contributing to when you meet a person, say you're thinking about them in a negative way, then you're going to react in a negative way to whatever they do then. And so if you're able to shift away and either just cancel that train of thought or try to see the other side, of what you were thinking about that was going negative. We do that, we do do that, and we improve the quality of our thinking in our mind and then our future reactions that the mind contributes to. We do that when we're waking. If we don't remember what we do when we're dreaming and have no control over how we react to things, then, we, then we're not using that way of 
of uh, developing our more subtle le levels of uh, awareness. And so we are, you know, harming the quality of our existence. So, so if you're a Westerner or anyone really, and you don't because Westerner, like a, someone who's educated to admire Western materialism, but they happen to be Japanese or something, then they, are, they might not think of them as a Westerner. They live in Tokyo, but they're being like that. And you don't know much about Buddha and you want to get educated, start reading some Buddhist texts. It's a whole literature. It's a huge one. It's not all about Buddhism. It's about they have novels, they have, they have poems, they have all sorts of things. Uh, you can keep going to your current religion or your MIT temple of secularism to maintain your belonging to the supportive community you grew up in, but try to expand your education by using the Buddhist literatures and therapeutic practices to become more realistic and therefore have more fun in your life. You can do yoga to learn about your body, where the cramps and blockages are in your where are the cramps and block blockages are in your muscles, your circulatory system. You can do mindfulness meditation, for example. I have a little, I'm told by a CAT scan that I have a little clogging in some of my arterial systems, and therefore, which is helpful to me, I got that information. Then I, when I do yoga, I think about the arterial. I try to go into my body and occupy that, and I try to nudge my circulatory system to sort of diminish the blockage. And I sort of try to feel it And I, when I move my muscles. And in yoga, when you move, it's very scientifically calculated so that you do a kind of a stretch where it moves the tissues around the veins and the arteries there, which then affects what's inside the artery. And it sort of, it's like you ripple, it's like you might clean something by banging on the outside of it and make something stuck on the edge fall off. Do you know what I mean? So you, but you have to be very delicate and gentle about it, of course, and they are. They have a science of movement and how everything relates, you know, bone, cartilage, tendon, you know, tissue, you know, like venal or arterial tissue, in the internal content, you know, quality of blood system, etc. In other words, the yoga connects, everything is all interconnected in there. And therefore, I'm working on that, and I've made, and, and the, 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 my cardiologist says, oh, it's a much improved, you must have changed your diet. Because he doesn't even think that by doing a, a, a tradition of moving, I've actually imp imp improved the way my circulatory system works. But your diet is also important too, it's internal. But by your conscious action also, uh, of your occupying your body more thoroughly by learning yoga, that is really very good health thing, actually, even without making a big spiritual fuss about it. You can do mindfulness meditation to learn how emotions arise from ingrained ideas and rote thinking, giving you more freedom and more critical leverage over what you believe and think, and how you react in situations like the, the great nun Tupten Chodron, how she said once in a lecture that always made an impression on my mind, don't believe everything you think. <laughs> I love that. In other words, you can be critical of yourself. You can find your sort of multiple tendencies as a personality, and you can criticize parts of yourself with other part with the more intelligent parts of yourself. And uh, why not? Uh, if you learn mindfulness, you can learn. You can learn. There's a more big. There's a more. There's a community of personalities inside there, and you, without you becoming to be a schizophrenic, you can move around within them. And there are many people out there who will. All of this takes you in the direction of greater realism, internal and external. And there are many people out there who will try to help you learn more, all without imposing any ism, such as a Buddhism or as a religion upon you or any other ism religion. Okay, okay. Be surprised and skeptical, no matter. I challenge you to take a look at this completely new perspective. 
Just like the Buddha, yes, you too can be a scientist about yourself, your mind, your heart, your soul, your body. Test these teachings and ultimately master life in unbreakable joy and overcome all difficulties if you dare take up the challenge. You too can know freedom from suffering through awakening to enlightenment. But that's not to be a Buddhist. You can be an enlightened Christian, secular humanist, enlightened Jew, enlightened Muslim, enlightened Hindu, enlightened Taoist, and whatever you are, a Baha'ist. You know, they have all kinds of other smaller religions, indigenous, shamanist. You can be enlightened in any of those forms. This enlightenment I'm talking about is a totally rational, practical, in solid, is totally rational and practical and in solid touch with reality. Although it doesn't mean it's only rational, and it can also take poetic leaps, but it keeps the rational common sense down to the, it connects the poetic leap to the common sense through the rational is the point. It connects the inconceivable, the magical, down to, to common sense in the rational, even, even illusory common sense it deals with. It's totally rational, practical, in solid touch with reality. It is rightly called realistic. At the same time, sometimes it's realistic to be a, take a leap of irrationality about something, actually, as long as you rationally know it isn't harmful. So then you can depart from that basis, take a little risk. At the same time, it is playfully in darkening, ecstatically transcending, sensually and emotionally fulfilling, as I said earlier, even orgasmic. What I say should seem surprising, even, quote, too good to be true, unquote. If you don't think it's too good to be true, you're not getting me. Hard to imagine to be sure, but that to being, thinking it's too good to be true doesn't mean it can't be true, on the other hand. Too good to be true is to say of what we say about something that is true, but we really like it. <laughs> it shows that we have a, in our non-fun way of living, first noble truth, non-fun way of conventionally living, we think it can't be true and fun and good. That what's really true is going to be bad, so ignorance is bliss, though we don't want to know what it is. Precisely, the too good to be true kind of saying has that idea in it. Okay. It, it, when it's hard to imagine to be sure, but when you can endure even a bit of cognitive dissonance, you can open up a new horizon of possibility. In other words, rationality also, like I always like to say, F. Scott Fitzgerald, I was so delighted, that novelist and somewhat profligated artist, uh, Gatsby, you know, guy, uh, but he said, the sign of a great mind is the ability to hold two opposite things in the mind without collapsing either one. Which doesn't mean agreeing that, they'll, that, that you know, rationality is no good because this could be the case or that could be the case. It means holding them there and realizing in specific contexts it's better over here rather than over there, but over there is still there is what that means, without collapsing that means. So it means you're much more subtle subtly aware of the ambiguities and the, and the nuances in things, which is how we, how we live in more appreciatively and more realistically. So it's rational to be able to tolerate cognitive dissonance, in fact. You, John, rationality doesn't mean you just collapse things, so it's got to be A or B, always. Sometimes, in some contexts, yes, A or B is important, law of excluded middle. In conventional reasoning, yes. But in, in life, not necessarily. Once you glimpse the possibility of enlightenment, you'll recognize that it was always there all around and within you. But you just didn't pay attention to it. Too good to be true? The good has to be false and the true has to be bad? Who says so? On what basis? See, we're already becoming scientists who try to see both sides. Buddha fun means, quote, Buddha fun means you can have it all. You, yourself, human, American, Hindu, Taoist, Jew, Christian, Muslim, secular humanist, Buddhist, red, black, white, pink, really, white people are really pink, brown, yellow, blue, green, Terran. 
you individual citizen of planetary society, you there, you are already a relatively enlightened person just by virtue of being human. When you dare to know your own real biology at all levels of the material and the mental and the spiritual and the cosmic, this becomes crystal clear. You can develop full confidence in your own enlightenment if you're willing to educate yourself in this teaching. Not a religious teaching, scientific, psychological, and cosmological teaching. This book can be your golden key to open the door to Buddhism-based science and technology, which will enable you to inhabit your own experience more fully, the really fun experiences you already have, yet only fleetingly enjoy. Okay, so you say, say you. So if I'm already enlightened, why do I suffer so much? Well, we have pain in life because we don't realistically know the truth that we are enlightened. Here's the shocker. Being in touch with true reality is so powerful that it completely overwhelms any pain, any loss, even of limb or life. That's a shocker. For example, if we were enlightened, say we lost somebody we love, and we're really freaking out about it, and we just can't let go of it. And then we were really enlightened, and we would know where that being is in the between state, in what between state, or in what future life state, or in some extraordinary case, in several future life states. Maybe one person became several people. That could happen. If we really knew exactly that, we would not be moping around about they're not here in the way they were. We would be, if there was something about the way they are now, we would try to be of help. And if they're fine by the way they are now, fine, then they're fine. They're doing fine without us, actually. <laughs> so that's why if you really knew all reality, which means omniscient like a Buddha, not just awakened like a Buddha, that's good, but also omniscient, fully aware of what's beyond awakening, fully aware of what's in darkening, fully aware of things that are invisible to the ordinary being, extremely invisible, you know, things, you know, and then we would be happy, is the idea, because we would be able to take care maximally of everyone. Some people, when you take care of them, that doesn't, they don't immediately get cured instantly, no, in their own awareness. It takes them time to unfold their awareness about how they have deeper connection to a deeper bliss, which then, then consoles them and, in fact, liberates them from their pain. Okay, emptiness and freedom. Now, I finished the whole section. Really tremendous. Almost two, three pages. Next, next subheading is short, emptiness and freedom. I think I can do that. In talks I give around the world, I am beginning to refer to this reality, ultimate one more, as freedom than emptiness. Uh, why? Emptiness, or shunyata in Sanskrit, is a, what we call, uh, what you call an absolute negation. An absolute negation is, is a technical term. It's different from a choice negation. In other words, or an implicative negation which is to say when you negate one thing, the other thing is automatically the case because it's in a binary context, a mutually exclusive thing. But, but if emptiness is not in a binary case. Emptiness is an absolute negation. It doesn't imply anything else positive by itself. That's very, very key to know. But it's, so it's a negation. So it's an absolute negation. Absolute in the sense that it only negates and does not imply anything else. Well, I'll just say that here. Emptiness means that all relative things are empty of any non-relative core or essence. So actually, it's a terribly obvious thing. If something's relational, it can't be absolute because it, it connects to other things and that changes it all the time. So it therefore cannot be like a thing in itself or by itself which is our idea of an absolute, absolute means non-relative. It's the opposite of a relative, okay? So, no, it is empty of any non-relative or absolute core or essence. 
Indian scientists discovered the decimal system. And shunya, which means they discovered the use of zero. And shunya was the word they used for zero, shunya, empty. It derives from a verb root, shvi, which means to swell. It is a, probably a cognate, a swell and shvel. <laughs> probably the same. As a seed swollen by moisture opens, creating an empty space within itself, a void, a free space. But we think of free as something good and positive, whereas emptiness or voidness is intimidating as it seems so close to nothingness. So I should defend, though, it, it's still good to use emptiness and voidness in most contexts because we're so stuck in our thinking that the material reality around us is absolutely the real reality. We kind of don't really understand, we don't really honor the complete duality between relative and absolute. So we sort of think that the relational thing is absolute, that's the absolute floor. It's got to be like that. And, I, and therefore, even if I was a real Luddite anti-science person, I would say that scientist who says it's just atoms and most empty space, they're all wet because I will bang my foot on that floor and I, that will prove to me that it's really absolutely solid. Okay, rather than it will prove to me that I relate to it by banging on it, so therefore it's relatively solid. So, so emptiness is so to jolt us, or voidness, it jolts us out of taking everything that we confront as if it was absolutely real, when actually it's only relatively real. So it should be, therefore, intimidating to our concretizing habit, our realist, a, real, uh, a realistic realism-projecting habit. So freedom rather than realist, realism discovering habit by being critical of what seems to only to be real. Like that's the habit that looks at the mirror and tries to reach through into the three-dimensional space we see reflected, collides with the mirror surface and then knows, aha, there is no three-dimensional there, it's just a reflection. That's what we're talking about. So freedom is a word to watch here as an encouraging synonym. On the other hand, once we know that there's no nothingness, that nothingness is also empty of any absolutely being nothing. <laughs> it's, also, it's also just a contrasting concept within the illusoriness of the floor being something. So once we know that, then it's good to use freedom instead of voidness or emptiness, because freedom is encouraging that then, then there's something I can do there. I'm still here in that. And it makes us, it, 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 it helps us avoid the trap of thinking an experience we can have of a kind of conscious unconsciousness through meditation, almost like a nothingness experience, where, but we're sort of, it's a, 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 no, a nothingness, a, a knowing nothingness, you could almost say. But that's a trap, because obviously it's still not nothing, it's a, it's a zone of knowledge. So we are therefore projecting our knowingness is projecting the object of nothingness. So freedom is a word to search, to watch here as an encouraging synonym of the famous and still useful emptiness. I was talking about its continuing use, use of emptiness that we will explore later on. So now let's talk about wakeful consciousness embracing cognitive dissonance, the next section. I might go a little further uh, in, this, in this one. Okay. Wakeful consciousness is embracing cognitive dissonance. How to do this? One way for us to move toward freedom is to examine the lens through which we view the world. I think here about the famous duck rabbit. Ludwig, you know, it's a picture, a duck rabbit. You probably can't see it from that distance, but you can see it as a rabbit with ears, with long ears, or a duck with a bill. And in order to see it this way or that way, you're looking at the same thing, and, but you're mentally flip it to where it's a rabbit looking like that way or a duck looking like that way. <laughs> you go back and forth, and you go duck, rabbit, duck, rabbit, duck, rabbit, duck, rabbit, duck, rabbit, duck, rabbit, duck, rabbit. And then can you see them both simultaneously? You almost can't, actually. You almost can and you almost can't. You can go right to the border of being able to see them simultaneously. You kind of really quickly switch back and forth. You almost sort of, they seem to mergle together where you see them both. 
At least I can. Because I go, I go back, forth, back, forth, back, forth, back, forth. And then it's almost like I'm seeing them both. But in a way, I don't see them both. So as you get to a sort of border there, look, it says, what does that mean? Okay. So you can see this as an outline of a duck head facing to your left or an outline of a rabbit head facing to your right. Once you see both, you can snap your recognition faculty back and forth. You can keep your focus and and snap back and forth faster and faster until you can almost see both at the same time, or can you? Are you seeing it one way and then imagining it really fast the other way? What does it take to feel convinced you see both simultaneously? Or does that not seem possible? How many times do you have to flip it back and forth before you see both at once? Or is it like seeing your face in a mirror where you see a 3D face as if through a window, but simultaneously know it is a mirror reflection on the flat, shiny surface? Are you seeing it wrong but knowing it right? Or are you seeing it right and knowing it wrong? What's the difference? Is there any? <laughs> That's really a great exercise. You should work on it, really. To take things a little further, Take note of how you experience this kind of duality, non-duality right in your daily life. How? Just think about the fact that you experience it every night when you fall asleep. At the moment you fall asleep, you let go of awareness and happily slip into unconsciousness, right? If a sense of nothingness existed as your base reality, you would fall into it since you totally let go, don't you? You kind of go, you do. But then something strange happens. You wake up. And if you sleep deeply with no vivid dreaming, it seems that you have spent no time at all in the unconscious state of deep sleep, right? Some mornings, if you are still tired from exerting yourself too much over many previous days, you're frustrated that you haven't slept long enough and aren't really rested. So you have no sense of time when you are unconscious as well as no sense of space. But you were somewhere, and time did pass, which you know by inference. I must have been in my body in my bed during the last hours, because here I am again, and it's a fact that some time has gone by. <laughs> right? That's, you get, that, that's a state you're in, that's cognitive dissonance state. We're kind of in it all the time, really. Okay? Like, I'm conscious of some part of what's here, but not everything. Furthermore, and this is actually, you know, they hypnotize people when they want to have to witness something, you know, and that person in being hypnotized can remember something that they didn't notice when they were conscious, but was in their peripheral consciousness. And sometimes when they can go back to the time, that time through hypnosis, they can just realize that there's a tripod over there with a camera on it to the right of me, and which I'm actually seeing in my peripheral version, which now I'm trying to pay attention. I can, I can keep looking at the one in front of me, and then I'm, I can simultaneously be aware of that one to the side because it's in my visual field. But then if I remember the time, I only remember sitting here in front of the engine, my dear friend Piotr and Irina and the camera with a little light on it. But the other reading is there in my awareness. So this is all again in the direction of going deeper. So for example, the duck rabbit, when I'm seeing it now, now I'm seeing it as a duck. Looking that way, at quack, quack, quack. We could flap his lips there and go quack. And when I'm seeing it that there, I could say there was no rabbit there. And I mean it, and it would fit with my experience because I'm just seeing a duck. Or I could just see the rabbit, and I could say, there's no duck there. So this is a little like in the Heart Sutra, where you say, no eye, no ear, no nose. And the other great one for that is also when you're looking in the mirror. You could see your own face in the mirror, point to your nose as you see it in the mirror, and say, there's no nose there. While you're actually seeing the reflection of a nose. But you say, there's no nose there. That's not thy nose. That's not the nose. So this is more the deep way of knowing these kind of things. Instead of there's no nose, it's, it's either there it is or isn't, you know. And this is a rational way of dealing with what seems to be beyond the binary thing, but yet persisting in understanding the binary thing. 
So not having to destroy it. In other words, push it to where you can see how it hovers with you usefully, and it helps project you beyond itself. Just like if you could do such an intense rabbit duck yoga of flip, 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 so fast that you kind of know they're both there at the same time. And, and actually, because actually when you know, when you see the duck, you know that the rabbit is potentially there by inference because you have seen the rabbit there. And when you see the rabbit, you know that the duck is there by inference. Similarly, when you see your mirror reflection in a mirror, although you know it's not your nose in there, by inference, you see it as your nose in there, so then you can use it when doing a complicated thing, a rational complicated thing of, you know, put some powder on your nose, uh, which is over here, which you don't see. But you see your hand doing it there, and so you can guide your hand doing it by what you see. So this is where this more subtle level and sophisticated level of dealing with the binariness of conventional knowledge by being able to hold cognitive dissonance in the mind is some is an ability you develop. You can be you can be in F. Scott Fitzgerald's great mind per, uh, person category by holding two opposite things in the mind at once, it, it, albeit in some different ways. Okay. Yes. Furthermore, and this is really important, you can reasonably think quote. I feel better when I fell asleep. I feel better now than when I fell asleep. So that spaceless, timeless, unconscious condition when I was unconscious could not have been a foretaste of nothingness, which is nothing to be tasted, since it is permanently not there. In fact, there must have been a field of energy around and within me, which has energized me, energized me this moment. Wow, I must have been floating in a medium of nourishment. Wow, now you're, you're, you're hovering around the concept of the clear light of the void, the clear light of openness, the clear light of freedom, the bliss of freedom, of beginning to like circle in on what that is, of what reality is. It must be very, well, I must have been floating in a medium of nourishment. So there was invisible energy around you that nourished you. Wow, maybe it's still here now that's nourishing me. But it's invisible now. Wow. Maybe it's more powerful than even what I see. That I'm, and actually, instead of thinking I'm somehow alienated, walking around on a floor, it's, I'm actually in a field of clear light of the void, along with the floor and the building and the other people and everything and the seeming open space in between us. It must be very subtle. I must have been floating in a medium of nourishment. It must be very subtle and easy going, since it didn't wake me up. And it, and it doesn't interfere with my dealing pragmatically with the seemingly differentiated things in the conventional world around me, even though I see them as a little too real in themselves, because I'm not fully, I'm not enlightened. I don't see them non-dually with being clear light and still see them in their differentiated way, which is, what is the way enlightenment would have to be, I can infer. And it, is always there, and it is always there when I fall asleep and get refreshed whenever that happens. So it must be there right now without intruding upon my waking consciousness. <laughs> I love that. In this way, you can begin to strengthen your trust in reality. Begin to sense the nature of the freedom of the space-like emptiness. It's different from nothingness. To continue our work as scientists, we can examine these points of... Co you see, nothingness has to be the opposite of all these things. So therefore, it makes you paranoid. If you think like the materialist scientists, that the field, the ground field, is the field of nothingness, then you feel automatically, maybe I'll fall into that when I die. Maybe it'll be terrible. But then you say, well, but I get, if I get over into it, then I won't be there, so I won't be, I'm not happy that I fell into it. <laughs> but as long as you're enjoying feeling anything, you're going to be scared of that nothingness. Really interesting. 
In this way, you can begin to strengthen your trust in reality, begin to sense the nature of the freedom of the space like emptiness. It's different from nothingness. To continue our work as scientists, we can examine these points of cognitive dissonance, and we see then that reality is perhaps a bit different from how we normally have been perceiving it. Quote, normally have been perceiving it. We can try to create a new normality so thank you. I dedicate the merit to you and me be quickly becoming enlightenment so we can help everybody else becoming enlightened as quickly as possible, equal to us. So we can have not just an elite that is lightened, some high, hoity-toity high people. Everyone can be like that. That reminds me, I'm going to explain a second. I loved his horns, the Dalai Lama once. It was, I wasn't physically present, but I read the interview. He was interviewed by somebody about all sorts of things. At the end, this somebody who was thinking of themselves, who is and was enlightened, more so than other people, I think, in some sense. You know, I believe that was truly, she was a good person, and enlightened and aware, more aware than, I, I don't think, a Buddha maybe, but I, I wouldn't know because I'm not one myself. So she may have been even a Buddha. But anyway, she was feeling elite at the time because she'd been talking to the Dharma. <laughs> so she, I can just see mentally imagine her leaning back in the chair, looking over at the Dalai Lama like a fellow elite, and said, by the way, Your Holiness, can you tell me if the, who do you consider to be at your level in the world of all the people you met? And so he's there. She's maybe hoping he will say some pope, some Christian mystic, Thich Nhat Hanh, et cetera, some, some saint somewhere or something, <laughs> some other lama, you know, or swami, Indian swami. He pauses for a minute looking at her, and then he says, everyone is at the same level as me. I'm just the same as everyone else, just like you and everyone. We're all the same human beings. Which, was simultaneously maybe a little deflating to her and also very exalting to her. How wonderful. So anyway, that's what we want. Buddha, as my elder son tells me all the time, people don't want to be enlightened, or maybe they do sometimes if they're wrongly motivated. But anyone, anyone, who, anyone who really got to be a Buddha was not motivated by wanting to be a Buddha in order to lord it over other people and to actually be somehow exalted by them and worshipped and this and that. But it doesn't want worship, unless that's the only way Pullman can relate to them and, think, and imagine themselves somehow becoming one with that person. If that's all right, then that's all right. There'll be a statue on a building. They don't care. But that's not their motive. Then they don't get anything out of it because they are all totally empathic to where the other person is. And if that person is sort of subtly feeling put down by having to worship some higher being in hierarchy, as people are in hierarchies, they certainly don't want that to be what happens to the person. So then they'll be, teach them Zen and say, you meet a Buddha and the road killed the Buddha. <laughs> anyway, we dedicate our merit to everybody becoming equal in the, and free and loving to each other in this way.